session. Let's move towards the next session here. Uh, so next we have is Coda Technical 101, and this session will be taken by Ashutosh. So Ashutosh, all set? Yeah, Naveen, all set. I think uh, I've been sitting and watching uh, how Peter is presenting all the use cases. So he's done the groundwork for me, I guess, and go and talk about how technical capabilities of Coda now. Oh, that's great, Ashutosh. So all yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, um, so uh, to start with, I think Peter did a great job of explaining what Coda has an offer and what you can use it for. So I'll just go into the technical details of it and try and understand uh, how basically Coda handles all these use cases. So we'll learn about different components of Coda and how they really work together. Um, before hey, we do I that- just Gavin, the producer, just wanted to find out who's gonna be doing the chat. Is it gonna be Peter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to tell that now. So yeah, it's going to be Peter who would be in the chat. And uh, to, to I'll just like to bring him up and uh, so we, we already talked about how the chat is handled, but still for people who have joined in for the first time, I'll let Peter explain that to them. Over to you, Peter. Yeah, so uh, again, when Peter is back here, so so uh, in these sessions, I will be monitoring the chats. Just uh, once again, no promotional stuff. Uh, I know everybody's pretty excited about the sessions, um, but if we see a, a promotional, uh, if we start seeing promotion stuff, we're gonna start banning the chat. So yeah, if you have any questions, just drop in the chat, I will answer them. Uh, and by the end of the session, I will also just like Ashtash bring up some uh, questions uh, to ask him live. Back to you, Ashtash. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. Well, that's Peter. Um, so without further delay, I'll just move on and share my screen so that we can get started. Yeah. So here we go. So, um, so before we start, here are a few of the references which uh, you might find helpful if you are completely new to Coda, and uh, you might want to have a look at them. So initially, we have our YouTube channel where you will find a lot of videos of, about Coda, and if you're new to it, that will be a great place to just learn and uh, see how things are done in Coda. There's a free training for you, and if, if you're interested for a training kind of stuff in Coda, just head on to training.coda.net. Um, we have the public Slack we have talked about. We want to communicate with the community, talk about what others are doing, how the how different developers are developing their applications on Coda. That's uh, the community, uh, slack.coda.net. You can join that. Um, documentation available at docs.r3.net. Uh, Coda is open source, so you can find the source code as well. It's in github.com slash Coda. If you want to reach out to us, like in the, the DevRel uh, team, then the email for that is devrel at r3.com. And if you're a Twitter guy, so feel free to put any tweets and the official Twitter handles are um, for a blockchain and inside r3. So you can use the hashtags hash Corda and hash r3 as well. All right, so with that behind us, uh, let's uh, have a look at our broader agenda for today. So we're going, we're going to introduce Corda. Um, so we'll talk about why Coda was built and uh, uh, what, what is the problem that we're trying to solve. We'll talk about different components of Coda, like the nodes, the node tree, and how consensus happens. And finally, we'll talk about how applications are developed on Coda and what are the different components that you need to develop and how they work together. Yeah, that's pretty much it that we'll be covering today. So starting with introduction to Coda. All right, so to understand Coda, we need to really understand why we built Coda. Why not just uh, uh, use something that was already in the market? Why we build a new product altogether? So uh, the problem lies in how the traditional blockchains used to work, right? So if you look at the traditional blockchains and try to fit them into a business perspective and how you would use them in a business use case, you'd find a lot of issues with them. So here are a few of them that I've pointed out um, and them being the issue around identity, uh, you, you don't really have a strong identity, right? So if you look at any public blockchains, uh, you just know your counterparty with the help of a pseudo anonymous key, right? A public key, you don't know who actually, who, who that, uh, to whom that particular key belongs to. So that's a problem. You cannot do transactions with someone you don't really know, specifically business transactions. And second is the problem around privacy, which is uh, more about, uh, it's so, Public blockchains have this great feature that everything is transparent. Everybody knows what uh, what's there in the blockchain. 
But if you think about it from a business perspective, is it really worth it? Do, do, do people want everything to be available to everyone? What about some private information? What about patented data? What about like pricing information? So what would you do with that? You can't put that on a blockchain where it's, it's available to everyone to see, right? So there is a privacy issue with public blockchains. And then finally, um, we have finality, which is uh, the, around the way how transactions are, are basically finalized. So if you have done any transaction on Bitcoin, um, basically, or any public blockchain might have uh, basically come in a situation that you do a transaction and you don't really know when your transaction is going to be complete, right? So taking the example of blockchain or, or Bitcoin, so it generally takes an hour, but it's not exactly an hour. It might take 10 minutes. It might take like two hours. It might take a day. You don't really know. So that's where there is probabilistic finality in there. You don't really know when it's going to be final. That's entirely because of the fact that how blocks are created and uh, I'm not going to the details of that, but uh, yeah, it's because uh, of the nature of how these uh, public blockchains really work. So you have to have your transaction in a block and then multiple other blocks needs to be appended in front of that for your transaction to be actually final. Um, but that never guarantees that uh, it would really be final at any point of time. So it could take any amount of time, which is a problem for blockchain, uh, for, for businesses. They don't uh, really like these kind of things because when you say that I'm doing a transaction in business world, you need to know where is that exact point of time when your transaction should be completed. Um, you can't go with probabilistic finality here. And finally, the ease of use. Uh, if you have worked on blockchain, basically you might know that uh, different platforms have different tools and different protocols which they use specifically for their own protocol, for their own uh, platform. Now that's something uh, which people have to learn. So one is learning blockchain, which in itself uh, is a new technology. And then there is the task of learning their particular protocols and their particular languages which they would have built to build applications on those platforms. Now that's a problem for block for, for blockchain developers because that significantly increases your learning curve, right? So we want to make that easier for people. So these are the different issues that we had with uh, traditional blockchains. And that's why we looked at building something that would solve these problems. So how does Corda solve these problems? And uh, we'll, we'll take uh, each of these problems and we'll explain how basically Coda solves them. The first problem we talked about was uh, the problem of identity, right? We didn't have a strong identity. So Coda is not a public blockchain. Uh, you do not uh, just download Coda and get into your network, or basically you have to have permission to join a network. And how you do that is by means of a particular KYC process, which is done by a particular entity. And once you're done through that entire process, you'd be given access to a network. And in that process, you also have to provide your legal identity or the legal name through which you want to register. So now um, you see that you don't really uh, have just these public keys, but you have a readable and a legal name which you can refer to your, uh, to your counterparties with, which, is, which, which significantly um, makes life easier for people who are transacting because you now know that there is someone who has been onboarded by a identity and he has a legal name. You really know that he's an actual um, individual or an actual company on the other side that you're transacting with. Right, um, the second problem is around uh, privacy. So how do we handle privacy in a blockchain? Well, blockchain is entirely the idea of having transparent data, right? So in order to handle that particular issue, what we did was uh, Coda is, does not rely on the global broadcast thing, which every other blockchain or public blockchain relies on. But in fact, we do point-to-point -point communication. So every transaction in Corda is, uh, is not broadcasted to everyone, but it's only sent to those parties who are involved in the transaction. So if you take the example of this particular transaction that I'm going to show on the screen here, um, we have a vehicle being transacted between Titan Tech and Bay Transcorp. And once this particular transaction has completed, then this information about this vehicle is only available to Titan Tech and Bay Transcorp. While you can see that ECMA International, who is a participant in the network, he would have no information that there is a transaction which has happened, or even there is a vehicle which exists in this particular uh, network. So that's how Coda works. So every transaction is point to point, but as a platform, uh, Coda will make sure that whoever has a view of their particular asset, they always see the exact same view of it. So Titan and Bay will always see the exact same copy of the vehicle that they're transacting. So that's uh, your privacy solved. 
Um, coming to the finality kind of part, uh, here I'll like to introduce you to one more component of Coda. Uh, so there are general nodes, which you see as Titan, Bay, and Acme, uh, which are transacting nodes. And then there is an, another uh, logical identity, I would say it's called as the notary. Now notary is something which is uh, taking care of uh, double spending. And what exactly is double spending? Well, uh, to explain double spending, let's see. Let's say that Titan and Bay had transacted this car. So basically Titan has sold this car to Bay, but Acme here doesn't know that this vehicle was sold. So Titan can anyways go ahead and sell this car to Acme again. And since Acme doesn't know that there was a transaction which has happened in the past, might as well accept this vehicle. So who is there to prevent this kind of behavior? Right, uh, so that's where the notary comes into the picture. And, Every transaction that happens in a Coda network goes through one or the other notary. There could be multiple notaries in a particular network, and it would go through one notary. And it, it, it's not just one node, it could be a pool of nodes, and they could run their own consensus algorithm, depending on how your consortium um, uh, want to handle the, 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 the consensus uh, mechanism. So it could be something like a proof of work, like more, more stringent to something very simple, like a raft. So yeah everything goes to the notary and once the notary has given a go ahead to a transaction it's completely final you cannot have a rollback from there you cannot say that well this transaction was finalized and i have to roll it back so only way you can do that is basically do another transaction overwrite that transaction um, which would have to go which you would have to go through the entire process of doing the transaction again so yeah notary is a uh, finality point so anything that goes to the notary is final now, one point that, uh, or one question that people have about notary is what happened to privacy? You know, everything is going to the notary, which means he's having access to everything, right? Well, um, that's not really the case. Uh, notary doesn't look at the content of the transaction, just looks at the structure of the transaction or the, uh, the UTXO model, if you know about that. And it identifies whether a particular transaction in the case of double spend or not. So I'm not going to the details of how that works. That's too early to talk about it. Uh, but yeah, for you to understand notary, is just uh, uh, just looking at the structure of the transaction or overall how a transaction. So what are the uh, what are the things that are getting in, getting as input to a transaction? What are the outputs that are getting created? It doesn't know what exactly within that input and output. It doesn't know the content of those inputs and outputs. Yeah. So that's how Notary prevents your double spend and it serves as a point of finality for transactions. So every transaction goes to the Notary and it becomes final. You can't roll it back. So your finality has been solved. And finally, uh, talking about ease of use, mostly related to developers, how you would uh, basically develop your application. So we thought of not building completely new stuff and uh, burden, uh, giving it a burden to the developers to learn them. But uh, we have been using things that are already there in the market for quite some time, things like Java, DBMS, ActiveMQ. You might have seen this, uh, if you're in any enterprise software development company, you might have used them. So it becomes really easier for you to understand Coda and start using it. You develop your applications on Java or any JVM compatible language for that matter. And all the data getting stored on the nodes are stored in normal RDBMSS, um, nothing like fancy there. And all the communication happens over ActiveMQ, so normal message brokers, uh, which is pretty simple for people to understand. Most of you would already have experience in these technologies. So it's easy to use for you. All right, so there we go. We have solved all the problems that we talked about. No more problem with identity. Uh, we have strong identity, um, no more privacy issues, no more finality issues, and it's easy to use. Hey, Ashutosh, it's Gavin. Do you think hey, it might be time for us to do a $200 giveaway? Yeah, definitely. All let's right, let me, let me bring up, uh, let me see if Naveen's around. Hey, Naveen. That's uh, I think we got some music for Naveen too here. One second, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna bring him up. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Oh, nice entry. <laughs> I hope I could also put on from that music. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Oh, awesome! So let's start with the first quiz. Okay, so let me share my screen here. And this is for $200. Can you believe that? We're starting the quiz with the big, big amount. US dollars, Naveen. Yes, US, US dollars. dollars. Yeah. Maybe I need a calculator to convert that into Indian currency for me. Yeah, can someone but, put in the chat what they convert that into Indian currency would be? Yeah. I would be surprised. And whichever country you belong to. So if you belong to a different country, mention your own currency in the chat window. 
and let's play the game for that. Oh, we got 15,000 okay. Indian rupees. Wow. Okay, we're standing by. Go ahead. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So how do we play this game? It's very simple. You just need to get your hold on your phone. And of course, who don't have a phone next to you, right? With the WhatsApp open, but get your phone and scan this code. Now it will ask you for the email address and a name. Make sure that you mention the correct email address and correct, email, uh, correct name, because that's where if you win, that's where you will get the notification from us. And okay, don't forget this also, code. Naveen, that they, they that it's all about the, not only getting the answer right, but they actually the timing as well is really important. Exactly, exactly. So you have to also be very fast while answering because you're competing not just with the score, but also with the timing. You have to be as fast as possible. And I can see some people are already joining. We got Teja, Shreyas, Andrea, Ashok, Kevin. Awesome. Someone's asking, a cigar is asking if you could explain it again, Naveen. This first one is hard because everyone has to log in with their email addresses, but they won't have to do it for the rest of the week. Right. Right. So when you scan this code, it will give you a link. Just go to that link and mention the name and the email address. Otherwise, if you don't have a phone with you, if you have extra laptop, you can go to slido.com, enter that code, which is mentioned on the screen, 526110. It will ask you for the code when you go to slido.com, and then you can join there. Uh, we have 40 people right now of, wow, we've got hundreds online. So uh, we'll probably give it another minute or so to let people get in because the first one's hard because they have to do that you know what maybe we have um i don't know if mike has any mike do we have oh let's you know what about some angels singing mike oh, mike. okay we've got already 51 people join Ooh. all those people joining way to go let's have some applause mike And uh, some yays, and then we should be ready to go. Yeah, and also, oh, Naveen, some people were asking in the chat if they don't have a phone, can they join? You can join from a browser. You just go to slido.com and type in the hashtag 526110. So just go to slido.com. You can play on your computer as well, too. Hashtag 526110. I think we're almost ready, uh, Naveen. I'm just going to let a few more people because two hundred dollars is 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 a lot of money. So I don't want to let anybody out, but we also have to get going because Ashutosh has got even more fun that's coming back. Yes. So uh, we'll give him another fifteen seconds, and then we'll get ready to go. Right. So basically, in the this type of quizzes, every day we'll be having five questions per section. So once we start, we have five questions, and normally the question will start as a you know easy, and then as it goes, the question will become difficult. So the first question will be easy, last question will be difficult. But again, we can change the sequence, right? So uh, make sure that you answer that asked as fast as possible. Now, this will be a tech round. So most of the questions are from technology and from the blockchain field. I hope you will enjoy it. So I think we can start with the first question. And the first question on your screen, look at your mobile phone, and here we go. The first question is, the Bitcoin network was launched in which year? Is it 2005, 2007, 2009, and 2011? You only have five seconds. Four, three, two, one. And let's see your answers on the screen. Okay, most of you are saying 2009. Let's see the right answer now. That's right, it's 2009. Awesome. Okay, that's a good start. Let's go for the... Next question. And as I mentioned, the question will become difficult to one by one. The next question is, which of this is not a public blockchain? Is it Solana, Ethereum, Corda, Bitcoin? You only have five seconds left. Four, three, two, and one. And let's see your answers. Most of you are saying Corda. Okay, some of you are still confused, but let's see the right answer. And that's correct. Coda is a permissioned blockchain. Awesome. Let's move to the next one. In fact, let's see the leaderboard here and let's see who is on top. And the leaderboard, okay, great. We got Raja who is on top. Uh, and you can see that we have most of them answering right answers, but it's also about timing. And that's where Raja, Pranav, Saurabh is on the top now. 
And let's see. We still have three more questions. Raja Pranav Sardab, keep it up. Let's see. Okay, next question. Which crypto blockchain works on POH, which is proof of history? Is it Ethereum, Ripple, Solana, Bitcoin? Five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. Time up and let's see your answers. Okay, that is a mixed reaction, right? But majority of you are saying Solana, is it the right answer? And that's correct. Uh, Ethereum is working on POW, moving towards POS, Ripple, not sure, Bitcoin, POW, Solana works on POH. Okay, next, let's move to the next one. Fourth question, uh, who is one of the authors of the white paper, the Byzantine's general problem? Is it Leslie Lamport, Raj Reddy, Satoshi Nakamoto, and George Orwell? Three seconds, two, one, time up. And let's see what you are answering. I know it is confusing on purpose. I have kept that question. The right answer here is lastly Lamport. Mm. Oh, okay. But some of you have given the right answer. Oh, now it's time for the last question. Now this is where you, it will show you a picture. You have to guess the personality. So last question. So that's your personality, the tech personality or tech celebrity, you can say. Don't go with the hints mentioned on this shirt. You can see the options in, on your mobile phone. And time up and let's see. Okay, most of you are saying Vitalik Buterin and let's see if that's the right, the right answer. Some of you are saying even Satoshi Nakamoto. Have you seen him, Satoshi Nakamoto yet? Okay, so yeah, that's the right answer. Vitalik Buterin and that's your first quiz. Now it's time to see who is the winner. And the winner is Andre Chan. Awesome. You don't know where to be up for the first and now you're on top. Congratulations, Andre. And you have won $200 US dollars. Okay, that was the first quiz. And I hope it was fun. I enjoyed. Uh, and let's see for the next quiz. But before, before we go to the next quiz, let's get back Ashitosh on this screen. That was Ashutosh, awesome. I hope you enjoyed. Yeah, yeah, very much. That was awesome. And congratulations, uh, Andre, for winning that $200. Uh, sorry for budging in between and take the, take the quiz. Uh, Ashutosh, all yours. Yeah, I think people would have loved this more than the presentation. <laughs> Anyways, all right. So coming back to Coda, I think it's really important for us to learn to be able to win this $200. So let's concentrate on learning. Okay, uh, going back to screen share. Just a second. Cool. So uh, moving on, we will learn about Coda node, notary, and consensus. We had a brief uh, on how Coda was developed, why it was developed basically. And now let's learn about what are the different components of Coda and uh, how we should use them. So starting with Coda node, so what exactly is a Coda node, right? So this is the real software which runs um, the Coda platform. So it's a JVM runtime, like uh, it, it runs on the JVM platform and uh, it basically helps you run your transactions. So this is uh, where the entire um, entire thing or the meat of the Coda platform lies. So every node has a unique identity, which is provided at the time of uh, onboarding, which we talked about the legal identity stuff. And that is what is used to do transactions. It's more like a black box. And as a node operator who, run, who is running this transaction, doesn't need to know what's happening underlying. So there are a lot of services which is in, which is inside there, which takes care of different uh, uh, different kind of functionalities, things like messaging, how you message um, different information to different nodes, things like key management, things like identity information, vault service, and a lot of other things. So you. Um, even as a developer, you don't really need to understand how these things happen. So you just have to use certain APIs when you develop your, uh, your applications and uh, the platform itself will do these kind of low level stuff for you. Um, so as a black box, it does all these different stuff and it provides you with two basic interfaces through which you can interact with the outer world. So one is the network layer, which is more about, uh, as the name suggests, is talking to the network. So it's, it's, it, this is how the node communicates with other nodes in the network. 
And then we have a RPC layer, which is basically for your node operator. So whoever is operating this node or whoever is basically giving commands to this node, commands like to start a transaction or to pull out some data from the vault. So that's where the RPC layer lies. So two layers to communicate with the outer world and uh, within the node, it's a complete black box. It does what you ask it to do, right? Um, now each node, can run multiple uh, card apps. So it's, uh, it, you could basically run an insurance card app, you could run a banking card app, you could run a like, trade finance card app. So you don't have to, if you have multiple use cases, you don't really have to have multiple nodes to run them. So one node can run as many card apps as you want it to. And the only and uh, the easiest way to um, install a card app. Now the term installing seems like a very tech savvy thing, but it's pretty simple. You just develop your card app, and just put it on a particular directory, which uh, the node will, uh, provide you called the card apps directly and once you put it there you just restart your node and that's it you're up and running so your node will load that card app for you and you have all your transactions available which you can trigger after that that's pretty much about the node um, that's what it is it's your software through which you can run transactions within the network well coming to consensus um Coda is a little different uh, from uh, the general or generic blockchain in terms of consensus. Uh, we talked about uh, consensus from the notary standpoint. That is just one side of the coin. There is other side to it. A notary prevents double spend. Um, remember what I said, notary just prevents double spend. It doesn't look at the content of the transaction, right? So how does the content validation happen? Who does it? So, so that's where two kinds of consensus comes in, the first one being the validity consensus and then the uniqueness consensus. The uniqueness consensus is what notary does that happens at a later point of time. Validity is what is the validity of the content. Now, taking the example of the vehicle that we talked about, um, we know that it's not a case of, uh, of a double spend or it's not a case of someone sell, sending, selling a particular vehicle twice. But do we know it is exactly the same vehicle that you're really intending to sell? So someone who is receiving it, how does he make sure that it's actually the same vehicle? Or is it even a vehicle? You would have to understand that you have to validate the content, right? So that's where the validity comes in. And it is done by individual participants. So everyone who is involved in that particular transaction will basically inspect the content of the transaction. They will run their smart contracts or their business logic to identify whether uh, whatever that change that is happening um, due to that particular transaction that they are approving is that legit and if that is then they will go through and they will put their signature on that transaction and that's how the validity consensus happens it happens at individual node level and finally once you are satisfied that your content is proper uh, you can go to the notary for a uniqueness check which is where the uniqueness uh, uh, consensus happens and the notary will notarize if everything goes well. And finally, your transaction can be committed on the ledgers. That's two consensus for you. Well, uh, talking a little bit more about notary, um, the primary purpose let we, like we talked about is to prevent double spend or uh, to check for uniqueness. Now, the notary um, can actually uh, be a single node, uh, like I said, which is uh, where if, if which is uh, where you just have a single node running and you send all your transactions to that node, uh, but it could also be a cluster of nodes, which we call as notary cluster or notary pools, whatever you might call it. Now, why wouldn't you need a notary pool so that it doesn't work like a bottleneck? And if your sing if you have a single node notary, it goes down, um, your your network is down for some time till you get that up. Now that's okay if you're like doing a UAT network or a development network to have a single node. Um, but if you're in production, it's highly recommended you go with a notary pool. So you can have single node, you can have notary pool. And there are two different types of notaries as well. You have validating notary and you have non-validating notary. So the, the till this point, we've talked about non-validating notary. The notary which doesn't look at the content of the transaction. But if you want to, if you want the notary to also inspect the content of the transaction and to validate what's the content of your transaction is, you can also use a validating notary. Uh, that there might be some use cases which would need something like this, where things like you have a, a sale regulator who needs to see what's happening in the transaction, and he needs to sign on that transaction. So a regulator will have access to all the transactions happening in a particular network. So in that case, you might want to use something like a validating notary. Uh, so it's there as an option. If you want to, you can use that as well. Now, a network basically could have a mixture of a single node or a um, uh, notary cluster. Now, it's not really necessary for you to 
uh, to have only one kind of notaries. You could have any mix of it. A network could have not just a single notary, but multiple notaries. So you could have multiple notary clusters. You could have multiple single notary and notary cluster mixture of all those things. So network doesn't only have a single notary or a notary pool. It can have multiple of these, and you can choose which notary to use as per your convenience. And things like um, that you would consider is probably some kind of uh, um, latency requirement, uh, which uh, if your notary is closer to you, you might want to use that or some other business requirement, which would require you to use a particular notary. So you could have multiple notaries in your network and it's up to you to choose which notary you want to use. Perfect. <clears throat> so that's uh, pretty much about it. Uh, a little bit of overview of what a node notary and how consensus works. Um, so next thing that we will do is we'll move on to understand how, what is a Accord app and uh, what are the different components that's there uh, in a Accord app. Now, the Cord app, for that matter, um, is the short form of Corda distributed applications. So Corda as a platform is nothing. It just does nothing if you don't have an application. So it's more like uh, having an Android or an iOS without any applications installed. So what would you do with that? The Cord apps are the real thing. You install these Cord apps on the, on the Corda platform, and that's what does the magic. Right, so let's understand what is a Cord app and how do you develop it? Well, um, a Cord app is basically composed of three uh, ba three basic components, I would say. It puts the state, the contract, and the flow. Now state is a representation of your asset. So anything that you want to put on the ledger is a state and it, 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 it it's something which gets updated over time. It gets consumed, it gets updated, and all those things happen. So anything that you put on the ledger, you will update it over time, right? So that's what is your state. And then you have contracts, which are your business rules. Um, so this is where you write all the rules that you want for a transaction to validate for, for it to be called as valid. So this is all your business rules. And finally, um, you have the, the, I would say the workflows, right? So Corda allows you to have or mimic your business processes with the help of the flow framework. So that's where you put your business workflows in there. Let's move on and try and understand how, um, what are the, these different things and try to understand a little bit more about it. The Corda State API has different hierarchies which you could use. So at the top of it is your contract state, which uh, every state must implement, which uh, or every Corda state must implement. You could choose to use co contract state or you could choose any of its subclasses. Now, uh, if you have a linear state, which is something like it doesn't, uh, so, so a linear state is something like a house, right? Uh, which which will not um, sort of uh, merge and split over time. But if you have something like a say a currency, right? A hundred dollars is equal to like two fifty dollars, so it can merge and split. So you could split a hundred dollar into two fifty dollars. So that's not a linear thing. So that's where you use fungible state. And then you have other helper classes like variable state, schedulable state, things like variable is one where you basically want to have your state represented in a separate uh, sort of uh, schema within your database. So you want the data of the state to be represented or to be copied to a separate schema for any purpose, like, uh, like things like integration with some other system or just reporting or such. So that's uh, another functionality that you could use. There are schedulable states, which uh, allows you to do even scheduling and stuff. So you could use any of these to represent your state. So, but the main point is that it should be a contract state or its subclass. Right. So this is what is your state hierarchy look like, and uh, it's uh, it's this is what a, a developer has to develop when he wants to represent something on the ledger. All right. Um, so once you have your state, uh, uh, you, you, you have transactions. So how do you basically uh, uh, do transactions? Right. So your state is immutable, like anything on the on a Coda world or a blockchain world. You put that on the ledger it becomes immutable. You cannot change that after it has been created, right? The same applies to Corda states. States are immutable once they are put on the ledger. So how do you update that? You update that by means of transactions. So this is how a transaction happens. You use a particular state that's there on your ledger. And obviously you're doing a transaction because you want to change something on that state. So what you do instead of updating that thing that you have put out, pulled out of your ledger, you would do is you would create a new state altogether, a new instance of it with the updates and you would create a transaction, you would mark the input as the one that you have just pulled out from the ledger, and you would mark the output as the one that you have just created. And then you would run them through 
some contract logics, which is basically your business rules. This will validate whether the state update that you're trying to do is legit, is legit or not. And then once that has happened, your um, contract has been validated and the notary has given it a go ahead. Only then at that point, your ledger will be updated and you will say that your transaction has been completed and the current most updated state of the asset um, that was involved in the transaction is the one that has been created as an output of this particular transaction. And what happens to the input? It will be marked as historic or spent, which means you cannot refer to that in the context of any, uh, any transaction that's happening in the future. So that's about it. So that's, uh, we, we talked about uh, contracts. So these are the business rules. Um, so these contracts need to be deployed to each and every node. So like I said, um, uh, the blockchain is basically uh, a network or corona network is where people don't trust each other. So everyone will run their business rules. Right? So everyone will need to validate that this transaction that I'm approving, is it valid? So everyone uh, will have these uh, contract code installed on their nodes and they will validate them. Um, so, and uh, this, this uh, transactions could actually be validated uh, at different points, right? So you, you have something called as commands, which comes into the play. Now say this vehicle, uh, which is here, which, we're, uh, which we have talked about in a previous section. Now, if I say uh, the business rules are available in the contract, now how do I know what exactly am I trying to validate? So if you say I'm trying to validate a vehicle, what is the action on that vehicle that I'm taking? Is it a registration of the vehicle? Is it a service of the vehicle? Or is it an insurance of the vehicle? What exactly am I doing? So if I don't know what I'm doing, what would I validate? So different of these actions will have different uh, kind of validation logics, right? So that's where the commands come into the picture. Now, when you say I'm trying to do a registration, now I exactly know that which what exactly I need to validate. If I'm doing a registration, well, these are the set of rules that I need to validate. So that's where your commands come in and they say the actual intent of your transaction. Each command could have different signers. Now to take this into uh, an example and try to explain, now take the example of registration, right? You have a vehicle which you're trying to register. You go to the registrar. Um, so uh, for the sake of explanation, let's say you as a owner of the vehicle doesn't have a say on it. So, so registration, you go to the registrar, he gives you a registration number. All you need to validate is whether the registrar has signed on it or not. And if he has signed, he has given it a go ahead that this is a correct registration number that has been assigned. You're happy with that. You don't really um, counter question that, well, uh, is this a right registration number? So just for and take an example, you might um, have that right to counter question, but uh, just for the sake of example, say you don't have it. Now, what does this mean that the registrar is the only signing authority? He's the only one if he signs then the transaction is successful, right? So the owner of the vehicle who is going for registration doesn't need to sign. So this means that you have two participants, the owner and the registrar, while only one uh, participant signature is really required for this transaction to complete. The other guy who is still there um, will receive a update, though he's not signing on the transaction, right? So if he's not signing, he's not required to validate the uh, command as well. So because his validations is not really required, so he doesn't have to even run the validation logic because the signature is not required. Now, it could be a different case for different scenario using the same vehicle, say a service case, right? You're going for a service. Now, service could be completely different. Uh, you as an owner of the vehicle will give your vehicle for servicing to the workshop. And the workshop once has done the service, needs to sign this transaction saying that, well, the service has been done properly as per your instructions. Now, as a owner, you might want to inspect whether the service has been done properly. So in this case, you might understand that you would need uh, the signature of both these identities involved, right? So that's why command has to accompany the signers with them so that we know who should sign on this transaction. All right, um, that's about contract and commands. Um, so moving to the flows, right? So we talked about assets, uh, which are your states. We talked about business rules, which are your contracts. Now, finally, to put everything together, we have the quota flows, which are your business processes. Now, if you think of any particular business process, you, you basically uh, get a visualization of particular steps happening in a sequence, right? So that's what a flow actually does. It does certain steps in a particular sequence. Now, from um, the point of view of the quota platform itself, there are a few steps that it need to perform so that the transaction can be done successfully and properly. And you can put your own steps in between like what data you want to get from others and all those kind of things. 
a flow can be really complex depending on how complex your workflow is. But uh, taking the example of a very simple two-party trade, let's try and understand what really happens within the flows. So say we have two party A and B who are involved in a trade and obviously there is a notary pool who is signing or checking for double spend. So initially notary uh, node A is going to propose an update which is like proposing a transaction, right? He takes out, creates a transaction, puts an input, puts an output and does all those stuff. And once he has the transaction object built, what he'll do is he'll check the check update is where he validates the transaction with the, um, with the, with the, um, the contract that has been installed on his node. Once he's happy with the validation, he can sign the transaction and send it over to the counterparty, which is node B in this case. And once node B receives this transaction, he will again validate. Remember, he doesn't trust node A to create a correct transaction. So he will again validate with the contract that he has. Once everything is fine, he can sign the transaction, send it back to A. And A, once has received all the signatures on the transaction, will send it to the notary for the final check on double spend. And if everything is fine from there, the notary will sign it and send it back to node A where um, it will distribute it to everyone who is involved in the transaction and it will be recorded on the ledgers. So that's what a flow basically, a simple flow basically looks like, right? Um, so a few points to note is uh, basically the general idea of having a flow is to um, basically agree on the process of updating the ledger. So you create, build, verify, and these are the normal steps that you basically do. So flows, as you know, can has to go in pairs, right? Because you have to have a party initiating the flow, and then there is another party with responding to the flow. Responding in the sense of getting the transaction and verifying it and sending it back. So you need separate piece of code, two separate piece of code. One piece of code installed on the initiator end, or the one who is proposing the transaction, and the other piece of code um, which will be installed on the other guy, right? The guy who is responding to it. So that's where we call them as initiator and responders. And the party who is initiating the transaction is most likely creating or building the output, creating the output state. Uh, but it's not always necessary that he would have all the information uh, to create that transaction. So he might ask for the information to someone else. That's where I said the flow can get complex. If you don't have all the information, you are going, basically going to and flow to different parties to gather all the information that you need to create a transaction. So that's what really happens. So eventually um, the flows basically guarantees you that um, once it has been run successfully, you are uh, having a finality on your transaction. Yeah. So that's pretty much what I had to say for this transaction, uh, for this particular session. Well, uh, now I'm going to bring up Peter and we'll see how we are doing on the questions. So Peter, do you have any interesting questions? Yeah, so actually we have uh, quite a lot of questions in the chat, but Sneha and I, we took care of most of them, but I do want to bring out a, a few from uh, the very last moment. So when you're talking about the flow um, transactions, so there's a question on, so will the initiator send a transaction to all parties involved in a sequential order uh, by waiting by, for individual nodes respond to one another, or it will send to uh, them uh, all together? And uh, before you answer it, uh, I actually want to um, say that in that question, there are two parts. Right? One is the finality and one is actually doing the process. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, all right. So um, if you have multiple participants, so basically uh, we have some inbuilt flows you just have to call and uh, you have to pass in the sessions of those parties that you want to send it. So what it will do is it will send it parallelly to all these different parties and it will collect the signature and it will get a well finalized uh, transaction which has the signature of all these parties. So you don't have to sequentially identify whom all I want to send and they will do that one after the other. So it's easy for you to just call a particular API, pass in the transaction and the, and the sessions of these different. Uh, uh, so you have APIs to create the session as well. So once you create the session, so pass in to that particular API and it will do it for you. And that answers the question. Yeah, so yeah, so that answers the question. Uh, and uh, let me bring up another question. So <clears throat> there's a question. Um, uh, is it possible that we can use multiple node trees in a single network? Yes, definitely. Uh, you could use as many node trees as you want, uh, and it's up to a particular node to choose which node tree they want to use. 
for their transaction. And like I said, it would depend on multiple factors. Like one could, one of them could be uh, like latency or others could be like some business uh, requirements that they want to use to a particular notary for their transaction. So yeah, you could have multiple notaries. You could have multiple notary pools, each running different consensus algorithms. You could have a mixture of a single notary node or a mixture of like any kind of any permutation and combination that you want to have. Cool. So, and actually, I, I see there's uh, questions coming uh, right in the chat. Uh, let me actually check with uh, um, Balaji more. So, do, uh, would you like to come to the stage and ask a question yourself? Uh, if you want, feel free to just you know raise your hand in the Zoom. Raise the hand. Uh, yeah, we need them to raise their hand, please, Peter, so that we can yeah. find them and then we'll unmute them. So if they yeah. just raise their hand, we'll be able to unmute them. And uh, is that, oh yeah, talking permitted. So Balaj Moore, you go ahead. You can unmute, go ahead. Uh, hey, hey, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So uh, having two questions, I uh, trying questions from notary points of view where as we are saying notary would be a party who would be ordering or attesting the transactions. If this is a case, aren't we saying notary would be a centralized party or acting as a bottleneck to the network in terms of throughputs and the privacy? All right, so I got your question. So the question says, uh, we, uh, we mentioned that notary is the one who is basically um, uh, every transaction is going through it and then people, and then uh, it has to give its final go ahead of notarization for a transaction to be completed. So is it not a bottleneck? Is it uh, like breaching privacy? <clears throat> All right, so that's the question. So yeah, um, to, to answer that, well, notary is, isn't like a central identity because it's not a single notary, it's a notary pool. And the participants, if say there are five participants in the network, uh, they could choose to run a notary, um, run a node in the notary pool on their own. So you could have a notary pool representing multiple identities and they're running a consensus among them. So that's one point. And uh, is it a bottleneck? No, because there are multiple notaries in the network. You could use any one of them. So not all transactions are going through one single notary. So it would not be able to, again, on the privacy part, um, like I said, notary unless it's a validating notary which is like a business requirement uh, you you need to have a regulator uh, to see everything which is obviously a privacy breach but that's your business requirement but if it's not that case it's a non-validating notary who is really not looking at the content of the transaction you know that there has a there has been a transaction and you do not know what the transaction was all about so what privacy would be breached there Is that yes? Does... Thank you, uh, Ashraf, for answering. Um, um, Baljumor, do you have a second question? I, I heard you say you have two questions. Do you have a second question? Oh, well, you guys put him off the chat. <laughs> oh, no, he can unmute if he wants, still wants to chat. Oh, yeah, sure. Baljumor, do you have another question? Uh, but still, uh, I don't, I'm not uh, that clear how we address the network bottleneck uh, with the help of notary. Uh, given that if you say I'm um, having some uh, application running, some trading platform running, and I'm looking out for liquidity, uh, and uh, if there is some market peak where lots of transactions are going on, sell and buy uh, of securities on the on the network. Uh, in that case, as we know that we cannot, uh, we would be sticking with, if I understand correctly, we would be sticking with a single lottery. Uh, with which uh, a particular trailing platform is dealing with. We cannot hop from one notary to another notary uh, doing the transition with something not supported directly in, in Coda. So given that, uh, given the you know, pool of transition that uh, at, at the peak hour we are saying, how, how that uh, particular thing is going to be addressed? Yeah, so uh, there's no single way of doing things in Coda because as you know, uh, the node level TPS and the network level TPS is completely different uh, uh, things here. It's not like a public network where you're uh, with the rise of number of nodes, your, uh, your, your performance of your network will go down. So what we really do with our clients who have high TPS requirements is that we uh, basically do a network design for them, which will basically uh, take into 
um, take into factor of all how your uh, traffic would flow within your network so that you get the most optimum uh, performance out of it. So this is an exercise which we do and there's some level of engineering required if you have very high TPS requirements. And we can cut down the bottleneck of the node failures by uh, having a proper um, traffic uh, going through different nodes and all within your network. Thanks, Ashash. So um, I, I think that's uh, that, that's actually answered that question. Um, thank you, uh, Baltimore. Um, we let me let me see if there's more questions uh, populated. Uh, Oh, also, can you can you explain one more time that Notary is not a party; it's more like a network service. So we have uh, people confused that uh, Notary is like it's a party. So if the Notary sees everything, then who owns the Notary will own the network. Um, that's not necessarily true. Uh, Ashish. Yeah. Uh, so a Notary, it's it's more like you can think of it as a service. But uh, yeah, obviously it is run by someone. It's up to uh, the network participants, like the consortium, to define uh, to decide who would operate the notary. But you could basically, it's it's not a party who is right, like uh, signing or or in, involved in the transaction. It's there to prevent your double spend in most cases, and uh, and we we consider it as more more of a network service, which is giving you a particular functionality of preventing double spending. Um, again, on uh, the case of privacy breach, one is you do not really notary doesn't really see anything. And so you don't have to worry about the privacy breach. And who runs it is up to, uh, it would be most, mostly a trusted party, which is basically decided by the consortium after um, they have gone through their governance models and how that work. So it's, it's more of a business decision on how you decide who the notary will be running. And, uh, and so, yeah, the privacy breach part is basically relevant if you have a non-validating notary because he has no idea what's happening in the network. He's just looking at transactions, looking at the transaction has few numbers and saying that, well, this is a case of double spend or not. Well, um, if, you, if you want to really know how notary works, you can just reach out to us on the Slack channel. We will basically explain that to you, but uh, it would require some time, so I, don't, I haven't really covered that in this particular slide. I think that's all for the questions uh, for the sessions. Yeah, and that was amazing session, Ashutosh and uh, Peter. Ashutosh, you know, I was able to link some of the things. I was able to connect the dots. So I was reading about Coda a lot, and then now after your session, you know, things were making sense for me as well. That's awesome, Love Ashutosh. <laughs> yeah, that's as I mentioned before. That's my weekend plan. Hope to get the coupon, so I can get started. Awesome, uh, great. So that was an awesome session on Coda Technical 101. And now it's time for some fun. Of course, that was fun, but let's move towards the Bollywood fun. Uh, so basically we'll be having the Bollywood fun and also we'll be having one more Slido. It's time to win some money, right? So we'll start with the Bollywood quiz first. So Dalai, all set with the Bollywood quiz? Yep, all set. Let's go for two questions this time. Yes, yeah, enjoy. Yeah. I feel like Alice down the rabbit hole. Okay, guys, here comes another multiple choice question. It's going to be coming up on your screen like it was the first time. Here we go. As of 2020, which is last year, which is the only Bollywood movie to have won 13 Filmfare Awards, which is kind of like India's Academy Awards. Is it A, Uri the Surgical Strike? Is it B, Article 15? Is it C, Sand Kyung? Or is it D, Gali Boy? You guys have about 30 seconds, I want to say. So put your put your answers in real quick. I'm going to give you the time to choose. Get your votes in. Looks like we have almost uh, 70. We're trying to get to 75% of the people. Come on, vote, everybody. Come on, guys. You can do it. Even if you don't know, just just take a guess. You have nothing to lose. Okay, go for it. Apna time aayega. Okay, I think we are gonna see the results now. Should we put up the results? Oh my gosh! Okay, you know what, guys? I understand why you would say Uri the surgical strike. It did do really well, but 
41% of you, which is the majority again, got it right. It's Gully Boy, which is a film about a rapper from Tharavi. Used to be the- you got it. Okay, let's pull up the next one right away. Okay, so which of the following movies was the first ever Bollywood film to release in Saudi Arabia? Ever. Was it Padman starring Akshay Kumar? Was it Razi starring Alia Bhatt? Was it Parmanu or was it Gold with Akshay Kumar? Come on, same thing. 30 seconds. Put your votes in. I bet you guys are excited for the next quiz, huh, with Naveen? That's where you're gonna win some cash. This is this is fun. This is keeping you entertained, but you're gonna win some cash too. <laughs> Get your votes in. We're up to almost seventy percent, so we just need a five more percent. We always try and get seventy-five percent if we can. Hey guys, I'm gonna give you fifteen seconds. Actually, give me ten seconds. That's a more fun countdown. Okay, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Two, one. Okay. All right. We're going to fill up the results now. And again, look at you guys. You are getting, you have gotten every single answer right. 34% of you. Gold. There you go. Fun fact, both those movies produced by the same production company, XL Movies. That's a fun fact for you. All right. Mm. Nice one, guys. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, it's just that I'm, I'm sure they're not Googling the answers because I was not able to answer any of it. You know, the first question, Gully Boy, I was guessing it because I love that song, Apna Time Aiga. And the second one, Gold, I was not able to guess it. Uh, but that's amazing. Oh, uh, I really, I really and, hope people aren't Googling it because that's cheating. <laughs> right, right. And also, you know, I'm, maybe I'm watching the movies in the wrong way. I'm watching so many movies, but I, I'm not able to answer those questions. Maybe I have to change the way I watch movies. I have to research something before. before you have to bring week. in your tech and analysis into the film experience. Right. That's the evening movie. So any, any suggestion, movie suggestion you will, you will give for the evening? Will I? Any Bollywood movie? Oh, you should. Oh my gosh, there's so many. But you know what? You should watch Razi. I think that's one Razi. of Alia Bhatt's like, really, really good performances. You should check that out. It's a female-led oh. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Delai, for the awesome quiz, awesome poll on Bollywood. Great. Hi. Now let's move towards the Slido. It's time to win some money, right? Okay, so let's go with the next Slido section. So Gavin, how much we are giving this time? Uh, we're going to give another $200 for the people that came on a Monday morning. We figured we we're going to give them lots of opportunities to get so two hundred dollars us uh is coming to them for the winner and uh just let them know how uh, how we're actually tracking the winning with the email addresses and stuff yes so basically once you win the event you will be receiving a mail from our site because once you when you sign in you also provided your email id right and that's why we are asking you to provide the right email address and your name so that we can track you and we can send you the mail it will not be instantly, but you will receive the mail soon. Great. So again, the same thing, you can use a mobile phone or you can use a browser. Just go to slido.com and enter this QR code or enter that number, 526110. And I can see so many people have already joined here. Gavin looks very happy today, giving $200 for, the, for each section. Great. Uh, how many people have joined? Let me just check. So we've got good number. Come on, let's, let's get that up. So we'll wait for five more seconds before we start with the game. Yes. And let's start with the first question. This is section two. And the first question is this who created bitcoin is it elon musk jimmy diamond mark zuckerberg or satoshi nakamoto 
And let's see the answer. Okay, so most of you are saying is Satoshi Nakamoto, that's great. Let's see the answer. And that is correct. It's Satoshi Nakamoto. Let's go for the next question. The Elastic Computing Cloud or Compute Cloud EC2 is provided by which company? Is it Microsoft, Google, Red Hat, Amazon? Five more seconds, four, three, two, one, time up. And let's see your answers there. Oh, most of you are saying Amazon, that's great. Uh, okay, some of you are still confused between Microsoft and Red Hat. Let's see the right answer here. And that's Amazon, cool. So that's Amazon AWS EC2, right? Cool, let's go for the, oh, now it's time to see the leaderboard. Let's see who is on the top leaderboard till now. Okay, uh, as we have done the last time, it is Raja again on top for the first two questions. Raja, you're not keeping up for the next three questions, okay? So you did well for the la last quiz as well. So I can see the same name sort of Raja. And this time we also have Karthik on the top. Great. Let's move towards the next question. It will be a bit difficult. Let's go. What is CAS? How do I pronounce it? CAS? Yeah. Cloud computing stand for? Is it cloud as a service, container as a service, CPU as a service, computer as a service? Three seconds. Two. One. And let's see your answers. Oh, <laughs> I knew it. You know, when I was making this question, when I see cloud in the question itself, I know it will be confusing. Okay, let's see what is the right answer. And it is container as a service. You know, when you don't run Docker. Yeah, I love, I hate that sound. Yeah, so, you know, Docker, so that you can run Dockers on the, on the CAS platform. Awesome. Let's move towards the next question. I know this question is difficult compared to the earlier one. Okay, Java sim JavaScript simulates class-based features of object-oriented language with the help of five seconds, four, three, two, one, time up. And let's see what you are saying. Oh, 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 it's time to open your JavaScript book and read and read or watch my videos. Okay, so let's see the, uh, let's see the right answer and that's prototypes. Yes, I know JavaScript supports functions classes, but everything is happening behind the scenes with the help of prototypes. And we are going for the next question, the fifth one. Come on, be on the top of the leaderboard so that you will win that $200. Fifth question, guess this personality. is very famous for his work. Okay, I can't mention the technology now. Maybe I can give you some hint. Something like internet? World Wide Web. Oh, okay. Uh, so I can see you are mixed reaction and led to the right answer. It's Tim Berners-Lee. Yay, 33% voted for that. The founder of, the inventor of World Wide Web, which is much simpler to pronounce compared to WWW, right? I don't know why they came up with this, even that short form of WWW. Anyway, that was your quiz and it's time to see the leaderboard. Okay, so we got Ravi Kant, Reddy, Kandari. Okay, the concept doesn't matter. Ravi Kant, you are the first winner. Uh, sort of you're doing consistently second, that's great, but next time let's go on top because we don't have any prizes for second, second one. Awesome everyone, that was, so Ravi Kant, you will receive a mail soon on your email ID, which, is, which you mentioned there. Cool, so that's from the Slido. Now it's time for, just a second. Yeah, it's time for some, to see some magic. I, I, I hope you're excited. So we have a magician, Mark, who will be doing some bottle tricks. I'm not sure how he's going to do that. 